My name is Anthony Rogers Wright. I'm the U.S. coordinator for The Leap. Been on the road with Naomi for three days now. It's really good to be home in Seattle. It's so good to be home. So now would be a good time to either silence your phones or depower them. And I have the amazing honor of introducing uh, brother, Mr. Ken Workman of the Duwamish Nation, the great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle to offer a blessing. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. If it's okay with you, I'd like to speak in a language that we weren't allowed to speak for so very long. The language is called Lashutsu. And so down here in this part of the, the country, we would use Southern Lashutsu for thank you, and that would be Kwadi. So when I say Askwadi of Chetisiaya, Twaldagwi, Hutch, Twaldagwi, Gwasishai, Twaldagwi, Bak, Stab. This is just our way of saying thank you, my friends, for your heart for your brains, for your, um, for all things. And for being strong people. But because we're here in Seattle and there's so many people that come from so many places, we also like to say thank you to all of them. And so for our friends that come down from Alaska, our Tlingit friends, Tlingit friends, we say Gunal Chish. And if you come down a little bit further than that and you talk to the Haida, they would go, how, uh, how, wa, uh, is the word that they use. And their Simpson neighbors, um, Deutschum. If I come down to Vancouver Island and our new Chenault friends, they make a little different sound for this word, thank you. They use the word, echo. And so we know where you're from by what you sound like. And so of our friends on the Canadian border, they go, Haishka. And for our Tulela friends just north of us, they use the word tig, so they would say, oh, tig weed seed. And for our friends on the Columbia River, our Cowlitz, our Chinookan friends, they would use the words highest Masi or Hayo Masi. And so it is wonderful to see you here today. Asaslav the BC judge is Siaya. It's wonderful to see you. And thank you for your, your journey, Ibashada, on Mother Earth, Adisha Hekwa all all Olgudaf, this this big place, this land. Disha Hekwa all all this big house. Hekwa Disha Alkwad Olgudaf Ata Dawabs, this place that we used to call Duwamish. Asquadidif Shat Twal Dagwe Hekwa Oyayus and for your big work. In my language, when we introduce ourselves, we do this generally. We go through our fathers and our mothers and our grandfathers and our grandmothers and great, and all the way back until we start seeing some head nods. And we go, oh, OK, now you know. You know, we, we know who you are. So, ya yustobs tizda is how you would say, my name is Workman. Ya yustobs tizda at the Duwams. I am Workman of the Duwamish. And great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle. And we say it like this so that people coming to this land, they will know where they are, where this place is, and they will know who you are by your name, and they will know who your family is by these names that we keep citing until we see heads nod. And so I would like to say, welcome everybody onto this land. And so when I say gui, this word, it means invite. But when I go gui gui hedak, it means invite everybody. And so like my grandfather who stood on the shores over here just 170 years ago, when there was virtually no white people here, and he said gui gui hedak to siaya, hadish ogurafata duams. And that simply said, welcome my friends, come ashore onto this land of the Duwamish. And so I say to you here today, it is a great honor for me to carry on in the tradition of my grandfather, the person that you know as Chief Seattle, when I say, Gui Gui Hedak, Gui Gui Hedak, Gui Gui Hedak, Hoi.
My name is Rick Simonson, and on behalf of everyone involved in making this evening happen, um, and after the, the welcome and thanks you've just had, we've all had, um, this feels kind of lowly, but um, on behalf of the Neptune Theater and the Seattle Theater Group of Haymarket Books, of The Leap, from whom Anthony, who was the first one up here to speak, and for the place I work, Elliott Bay Book Company, we want to welcome and thank you very much for being here. We also want to say that it is um, a, a deep honor and, and uh, to have Naomi Klein here tonight uh, for a book that a year ago I'm sure she did not think she would have written or had reason to write. And I say this because Naomi Klein has for about 20 years as a journalist, as a documentary filmmaker, and as a book author, been writing and, and helping uh, narrate and, and identify um, some of the forces, many of the forces that really have, are at work in this world and that um, mostly nefarious and, and ill-willed ones. But she's, she's helped identify them and help us know them in order to know them and do battle with them. She's done this with no logo, in books with no logo, uh, with the shock doctrine, with this changes everything. And even in her subtitles, there's not only the, the, those titles that have entered the, the public language too, what, what the shock doctrine is, uh, but the subtitles, the, the subtitle of the shock doctrine is the rise of disaster capitalism. Uh, that helped, uh, if that we didn't coin uh, disaster capitalism, it helped gave it a currency. And uh, the subtitle of this changes everything is capitalism versus the climate. I mean, laid it out starkly. But what is at work in those books and in our journalism, which has included uh, work in The Intercept and in uh, The Guardian and The New York Times and The Nation and, and again in the books, uh, is a deeply thoughtful, deeply researched way of looking at these things. And um, if she's, you know, she would go immerse herself in Milton Friedman economics, um, which is a thankless thing for any of us to think of <laughs> in writing the shock doctrine and going to climate deniers conferences for this changes everything. Uh, all of these, you know, she, she immerses herself in, and l helps articulate what is going on there and, and for us to know better what we are dealing with. The book she's here for tonight um, is a book entitled No Is Not Enough. And it's, uh, th that title itself is not enough because there's a subtitle uh, which is resisting Trump's shock politics and winning the world we want, no, winning the world we need. Uh, so this book, which draws on, uh, because it, it, you read this, I haven't, in fact, I haven't read the finished version of the book. I have a feeling it may even have the Republican health plan in it because it feels so up to date. Uh, reading the, I read one of these advanced copies and I thought, when did she stop writing this? Uh, because it's got everything go as we've been going along this year. But it's not only a, an account of what's going on now, but, but what's led deeper forces that um, are at work and have been at work. Um, and in, in her own work, uh, drawing on Donald Trump as a brand, which drew her back to the No Logo work in a way she hadn't really revisited for a while. So it's, it's an important, timely, vital book and that it's getting, the response it's getting um, is resulted already in something that's never happened for her or for Haymarket Books. Uh, a week from this Sunday, this book just came out, this um, bright, vivid, orange book with the big no on the cover. It's barely gotten uh, released, and uh, in, the, in a week from this Sunday's New York Times, it'll appear as the number two paperback bestseller. Uh, that's... That's never happened for Naomi, even as important as those other books have been. It's never happened for Haymarket Books. And I'd say a little bit about Haymarket um, here, because uh, Haymarket Books is a nonprofit publisher that's not been around that long and has, uh, yet in that time it's been around, uh, established itself as, as the foremost radical, um, deeply, but deeply versed, um, smart uh, press um, at work in this country. It's a pro um, we have on our table out there, some of these books will be familiar to you, the recent, all these recent books by Rebecca Solnit, men explain things to me. Uh, Angela Davis's uh, you know, recent work, um, History is a Constant Struggle, uh, and Arundhati Roy, who is in town next week with a new novel, but 
uh, her nonfiction of the last 20 years are among the books they've done. Even Seattle um, is covered with, in a sort of interesting way to show the way Haymarket does things because it has Seattle teacher and activist Jesse Hagopian's book about schools and teaching that he edited, but also has Aaron Dixon's memoir about being a Black Panther in Seattle 50 years ago. And it has, I mean, this is the way they work in media and with the activism, but also deeper, farther back. Uh, the late Harvey O'Connor's book on the Seattle general strike of 1919 called Revolution in Seattle. So this is, this is a kind of, this is part of what's going on with what Haymarket's done, and it's a publisher that Naomi chose to, um, to publish this book with. And um, so anyway, that's, you're, you're being here tonight, and, and you can actually, I'm not usually the rah-rah one on these bestseller things, but you can help send her over the top to be number one by... Uh, purchasing the book, which we'll have out in the, which if you haven't seen, there's a table out there, and I think more will get said, but there's also other groups who are involved with helping get word out about tonight, but also about what needs to be done, and uh, those are out in the lobby afterwards. I'll say a little bit, because I don't think I'm going to be up here again, uh, is that when this is over, um, the, there is the table out there, and Naomi will be out there to sign books. The line more or less goes that way and goes up, so if you're on this side, go out that way. If you're, if you're not going to get a book, you can go ahead and go out this way, but you'll, there'll be people from the theater helping direct all that when it happens. Um, lastly, I just want to say, among the many awards and, and citations that Naomi has received, one of the most prestigious, because this, her work really is, is recognized around the world, uh, last year uh, in Australia she received the Sydney Peace Prize, which is, is one of the most prestigious ones in the world. And According, she was, this is a citation though for, for this award because she is inspiring us to stand up locally, nationally and internationally to demand, to demand a new agenda for sharing the planet that respects human rights and equality. For all of us involved, uh, again, we thank you for being here and now I ask you to please join in welcoming Naomi Klein. I've missed you, Seattle. I'm so glad to be back. Um, I first want to thank Ken Workman for that heartfelt, multilingual welcome to these beautiful stolen lands and for being such an important part of the movement for indigenous land rights and restitution. I also want to thank uh, Rick from Elliott Bay Books. Um, thank you for being here, supporting such a wonderful independent bookseller. Um, and also Deborah from the, C from the Seattle Theater Group. And as you heard, I, I published this book with Haymarket, um, and it's just been such a pleasure. Um, I, I have been writing books critical of multinational corporations for almost 20 years, um, so it's to my great shame that this is the first book I've ever published with a radical independent publisher. <laughs> um, and um, it feels really great to know um, that as the book succeeds, it's helping Haymarket to succeed. This is a book that I wrote to try uh, to play some small part in growing an amazing movement, and it is great to be with a publisher that is committed to those very same goals. Um, you heard from my wonderful colleague, Anthony Rogers Wright. He's going to be coming back on stage at the end of the evening to talk about some of the amazing local groups who you may have seen on your way in, who have tables here. Um, we are also going to be hearing from a young man uh, who is suing the U.S. government for failing to protect his generation from the climate crisis. Um, <clears throat> So it's going to be a rich and multi-layered evening, and I really want to urge all of you to stay here and not miss any of it. And as you leave, um, make sure to check out uh, the tables of the local groups and find out more. Um, I'm going to just spend a uh, minute, a few minutes, reading from the new book, and I'm going to make an assumption about Seattle audiences <clears throat> by cutting to the chase and reading from the conclusion. 
Um, I think you're ready for that, okay? Um, all right. <clears throat> a great many people, myself included, have used the word shock to describe Donald Trump's election and the first months of his presidency, and understandably so. In his first week in office, Trump signed a tsunami of executive orders that had people reeling, madly trying to keep up. Since then, he's never allowed the atmosphere of crisis to let up. But as I've reflected on the word shock, I started to question its accuracy. A state of shock is produced when a story is ruptured, a bolt from, from the blue. But in so many ways, Trump is not a rupture at all, but rather the culmination, the logical endpoint of a great many dangerous stories our culture has been telling for a very long time. That greed is good, that the market rules, that money is all that matters in life, that white men are better than the rest, that the natural world is there for us to pillage, that the vulnerable deserve their fate and the 1% deserve their golden towers, that anything public and commonly held is sinister and not worth protecting, that we are surrounded by danger and should only look after our own, and that there is no alternative to any of this. Given that these stories are the very air we breathe, Trump really shouldn't come as a shock. A billionaire president who boasts he can grab women by the genitals while calling Mexicans rapists and jeering at the disabled is the logical expression of a culture that grants indecent levels of impunity to the ultra-rich, that is consumed with winner-take-all competition, and that is grounded in dominance-based logic at every level. We should have been expecting him. And indeed, many of those most directly touched by the underbelly of Western racism and misogyny have been expecting him for a long time. So maybe the emotion behind what some have been calling shock is really, more accurately, horror. Specifically, the horror of recognition that we feel when we read effective dystopian fiction or watch good dystopian films. All stories of this genre take current trends and follow them to their logical conclusion and then use that conclusion to hold up a mirror and ask, do you like what you see? Do you really want to continue down this road? These nightmare futures are horrifying precisely because they are not shocking. Not a break from our underlying stories but their fulfillment. I've come to believe that we should see America's first nuclear arm reality TV show branded president in a similar fashion, as dystopian fiction come to life. Trump is a mirror held up not only to the United States but to the world. If we don't like what we see, and throngs of us clearly do not, we know what we must do. We have to question not only Trump, but the values and systems that ineluctably produced him. The same values that have been playing out in destroyed safety nets, exploding prison populations, surging white supremacy, normalized rape culture, democracy destroying trade deals, and rising seas. At the same time, perhaps it's okay, healthy even, for us to be just a little bit shocked by Trump. Here's why. Those stories that produced him were always contested. There were always other stories, ones that insisted that money is not all that's valuable, and that all of our fates are intertwined with one another and with the health of the natural world. The forces Trump represents have always tried to suppress those other, older, and self-evidently true stories, often violently, so that theirs could dominate against so much intuition and evidence. And the persistence of these other stories should remind us that while Trump is the logical culmination of the current neoliberal system, the current neoliberal system is not the only possible culmination of the human story. 
which is why part of our work now, a key part, is not just resistance, not just saying no. We have to do that, of course, but we also need to fiercely protect some space to dream and plan for a better world. This isn't an indulgence. It's an essential part of how we defeat Trumpism. For me, and this may sound a bit strange, Trump's rise has also prompted a more internal kind of challenge. It has made me determined to kill my inner Trump. How about you? Is there anything just a little bit Trumpish worth examining? Maybe it's the part whose attention span is fracturing into 140 characters and that is prone to confusing followers with friends. Maybe it's the part that's learned to see ourselves as brands in the marketplace rather than as people in communities. Or the part that sees other people doing similar work, not as potential allies in a struggle that will need all of our talents, but as rival brands competing for scarce market share. Given that Trump's presidency is the culmination of corporate branding's insidious logic, perhaps it's time to leave some of that behind. Or maybe it's the part that just can't resist joining a mob to shame and attack people with whom we disagree, sometimes using cruel personal slurs with an intensity set to nuclear. Or maybe, just maybe, it's the part that is secretly waiting for a billionaire to ride to the rescue, except that this one will be kind and generous and concerned about climate change and empowerment for girls. The liberal billionaire savior myth may appear very far from Trump, but the fantasy still equates great wealth with superhero powers, which, once again, is just a little too close for comfort to his majesty of Mar-a-Lago. If some of these impulses and stories seem hardwired in us, it's for a very simple reason. Willingly or not, anyone who consumes and produces media swims in the cultural waters of reality TV and personal branding and nonstop attention splintering messages, the same waters that produced the Trump presidency. There are different parts of that fetid swimming pool, to be sure. And some people are in zones with no lifeguards and with way more waterborne diseases than others. But it's still hard to get genuinely outside of the pool. Recognizing this can help clarify our task. To have a hope of changing the world, we're going to have to be willing to change both the culture and ourselves. And a great many of us are clearly ready for that, for a captivating, transformative vision that lays out a plan for tangible improvements in daily life, unafraid of powerful words like redistribution and reparation, and maybe even democratic socialism. And perhaps we should thank Trump for this newfound ambition, at least in part. The shamelessness of his corporate coup has done a tremendous amount to make systemic change seem more necessary to a lot of people. Because if titans of American industry can eagerly line up behind this man, and if Wall Street can cheer on news of his plans to let the planet burn and the elderly starve, and if so much of the media can praise his cruise missiles ordered over chocolate cake as presidential, well, then a great many people are coming to the conclusion that they want no part of a system like that. With this elevation of the basest of figures to the most exalted of positions, the culture of maximum ex extraction, of endless grabbing and disposing, is reaching some kind of breaking point. Clearly, it is the culture itself that must be confronted now, and not just policy by policy, but at the root. For decades, elites have been using the power of shock to impose nightmares. Donald Trump thinks he'll be able to do it again, that we will be overwhelmed by events and will ultimately scatter, surrender, and let him grab whatever he wants. But crises do not always cause societies to regress and give up. 
there is also always a second option, that faced with a grave common threat, we can choose to come together and make an evolutionary leap. We can choose, as the Reverend William Barber puts it, to be the moral defibrillators of our time and shock the heart of this nation and build a movement of resistance and hope and justice and love. We can, in short, surprise the hell out of ourselves by being united, focused, and determined, by refusing to fall for these tired old shock tactics, by refusing to be afraid no matter how much we are tested and we will be tested. The corporate coup Trump and his billionaire cabinet is trying to pull off is a crisis with global reverberations that could echo through geologic time. How we respond to this crisis is up to us. So let's choose that second option. Let's leap. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, as you saw in the promotions for this event, the plan was for me to be in conversation with Jesse Hagopian, local Seattle, Seattle teacher and hero who's become a friend of mine. I asked Jesse if we could be in dialogue about this book because he'd reached out to me a few years uh, back about the shock doctrine, and he told me at the time that he had seen the shock doctrine in action when he was in Haiti during that horrific earthquake and he'd also seen it in the school system where he works as a teacher. So I had wanted to talk to him about this book because it deals in part with how shocks are shaping events once again. And I also wanted to talk to him because we cannot understand Trump and Trumpism without understanding the rise of anti-black racism and surging white supremacy, something Jesse knows a lot about as a Black Lives Matter activist. As many of you know, Jesse sued the Seattle Police Department after he was pepper, pe pepper sprayed while walking down the street talking on the phone at a MLK Day demonstration. And scandalously, the officer involved received nothing more than a verbal reprimand. But they did come to a financial settlement and Jesse used that money to create a racial justice scholarship fund for young people. And just this week, they awarded the scholarships to a terrific group of students with the help of another one of your local heroes, Seattle Seahawk, Michael Bennett. Yes, that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> And we planned this some weeks ago, but as the date for the event approached, I was painfully aware that it was particularly important to be in dialogue with Jesse now because of the state of grief so many in the city are in after the horrifying police killing of Charlena, of Charlena Lyles. Pregnant with three of her four kids in the house with her, she had called the police to report a burglary and she was murdered. Her, her kids had to walk over her body. Jesse, just this past week, helped lead an effort to claim Charlena Lyles as a beloved part of the Seattle education system with kids enrolled in Seattle schools. And earlier this week, hundreds of teachers went to school wearing Black Lives Matter t-shirts, standing up for Charlena Lyles and saying her name. This is the same week, let us not forget, that the police officer who shot Philando Castile without provocation while he was in his car was scandalously acquitted. And just yesterday, we saw new horrifying footage that confirmed just how unprovoked that attack was. Castile was a beloved employee at a Montessori school in St. Paul, Minnesota. I've been on book tour now for a couple of weeks, and I really have to tell you that at every stop, I've heard more stories of this kind of hatred and violence, and places are really feeling like a tinderbox. Now, the right doesn't have a monopoly on violence. We launched the book in Washington, D.C. 
on the day of that horrific shooting at the baseball practice that targeted Republican lawmakers, the city was in shock. And I was lucky enough that night to share the stage with the woman many of you know, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. <laughs> um, <laughs> And she helped ground us and put those attacks in perspective um, because we know that so much more violence is being directed at people of color. Earlier this week, Nabra Hassanem, a Muslim teen, was killed with a baseball bat in a suburb of Washington, D.C., that same city. And if that wasn't bad enough, two days later, a memorial for her in downtown Washington, D.C. was set on fire. Sorry, just two days ago. We were in Portland on Monday, and I shared the stage there with Joanne Hardesty, a leader in the, of the local NAACP chapter. And of course, we talked about the heroic young men who had been killed less than a month ago on Portland Public Transit, the MAX, after intervening to try to stop the harassment of two girls of color, one wearing a hijab. Joanne shared with us that though these men were indeed local heroes, their deaths might have been prevented. Why? Because the day before, this same white supremacist rage machine had thrown a bottle at an African-American woman, and she'd called the police to report the attack. But according to Joanne, the police didn't take that attack seriously enough, and in fact started questioning the woman who had just been attacked, treating her like a criminal. How many times does this have to happen? That black people turn to the police for help and end up being profiled themselves or worse, killed. So Jesse and I were gonna be talking about this, but for personal reasons, he has been unable to take part in the conversation tonight and I respect his decision. So in a big hurry, I tried to think about who I could invite instead to help us understand this moment and all of our responsibilities in it. And I thought immediately about my friend Kianga Diamata Taylor, author of the brilliant book, From Black, Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, also published by Haymarket. Kianga, who is a faculty member at Princeton, was one of just four people who read No Is Not Enough in draft form and gave me invaluable feedback and made the book better. So I asked her to do that because she is one of the sharpest intellects in the country when it comes to connecting our brutal economic system that has concentrated so much wealth, such obscene levels of wealth, into such, so few hands. She connects that with the targeting of people of color, with women and members of LGBTQ communities. I love Kianga, but I thought, well, Kianga can't come because Kianga has herself been the target of this rising tide of race-based hatred. Just three weeks ago, she had to cancel a speech here in Seattle at the town hall, at another in San Diego, after a wonderful commencement address she gave at Hampshire College was seized upon by Fox News, and it went viral in all the wrong circles. She had dared to tell those graduating students the truth about Donald Trump's racism and misogyny, and that was apparently unacceptable because as the clip circulated, all of a sudden she was inundated with extremely specific and graphic death threats, so much so that after consulting with experts, she did not consider it safe to stand in front of rooms like this when her presence had been advertised long in advance. So Kianga hasn't been doing public events lately, which is a real loss to our movements because we need her voice now more than ever. She's letting things cool off. But you know, I called Kianga anyway and I told her the situation with Jesse and I said, well, what if we don't tell anyone that you're coming until the last minute before you walk on stage? <laughs> because I know many people in Seattle were saddened when you had to cancel and want to hear from you. And you know what? She said yes. She said... <laughs> she said yes, that she's ready to come back. So please join me in welcoming my friend, my hero, Kianga Yamada Taylor.
Kianga. Hello. So, I have a question for you. Um, why, why did you decide to come? <laughs> um, well, first, let me just thank you for um, inviting me. Uh, it's very exciting to actually be here um, in Seattle under a different set of circumstances. So let me just say why I didn't come. Um, Naomi gave some of the uh, backstory. Uh, on May 20th, I'd given a commencement um, address at Hampshire College um, in Western Massachusetts. And in the uh, uh, speech, you know, I, I may have talked about Donald Trump for 90 seconds out of a, a 20 minute address uh, where I uh, referred to him as a racist and sexist megalomaniac. Um, really, words that I thought were uncontroversial. Um, <laughs> and uh, the people at Hampshire liked the uh, speech that so much that they created a separate video and circulated it, and by the end of the week it had been seen many times, and uh, at that point had fallen um, into the consciousness of the people at Fox News, um, who I later came to find out uh, did a print story about the speech on Thursday, ran a television segment on Friday, ran another television segment on Saturday, and ran another print story uh, about a speech from a junior faculty member uh, speaking to a group, you know, a graduating class at a um, liberal arts college. Uh, so they did four news stories um, over Memorial Day weekend. Um, and I started getting uh, threats, uh, you know, racist emails, uh, death threats uh, over the next several days. And so, um, I was supposed to give a talk here um, on uh, the, the Wednesday, and um, I was actually uh, on my, I, I had been working all morning, I went home uh, to just sort of get my things together at the last minute, um, and I got a, an email from uh, an officer at Princeton um, who I had sent all of the emails to um, uh, the day before, and he sent me an email asking if I could call him, uh, you know, that afternoon. Um, and this was four hours before my flight. Um, and so uh, I called the, the officer and he said that, um, I just want you to know that we find uh, these emails to be extremely alarming. Uh, and he started to rattle off uh, a number of security um, protocols that I should implement. And so, you know, um, I had already been sort of nervous and, and uneasy. Uh, I've never received death threats. Um, I've gotten, you know, I write a lot, and so I've certainly uh, gotten nasty emails from conservatives who don't like what um, I have to say about things periodically, but never uh, anything um, like this. I think in four days I got uh, 56 emails. There were another dozen emails sent uh, to my uh, department, um, and you know, I continued. I, I think in total, I got something like 70 uh, emails. Um, and so, the last thing that the officer said to me um, when we got off the phone was that if at any point in time uh, you don't feel comfortable about something, then just don't do it. Um, and so, I, I, this was in the, the context, as people know, of. The, the student at University of Maryland um, having been killed uh, by someone associated with an alt-right uh, student group uh, on, on Facebook. Uh, it was a few days after uh, the murders in um, Portland. And, you know, it was, it was a very uh, uh, tension-filled um, moment for me and for, for, you know, my family and for uh, just in general. Um, at that point, and so I made the decision um, not to not to come. But having said all that, I do think that um, it's important to it, it's one understanding that there is a strategy for for some people 
um, to really harangue and harass uh, people um, that they think, uh, particularly on college campuses right now, um, who they perceive to be radical or liberal or who really think differently from them to harass and harangue them into silence. And so it's not just me. Uh, there's Professor Saida Grundy uh, from Boston University two years ago who tweeted about white supremacy uh, and received death threats and threats to her job. Uh, Zandria Robinson, who's a, a professor at Rhodes College, uh, a black woman who tweeted about racism, who wrote an article about racism, uh, received death threats and threats to her job. Uh, and, and there's a, 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 a professor just recently, uh, Johnny Eric Williams at uh, University um, of, uh, of Connecticut, uh, who um, uh, received so many threats that yesterday the uh, or, I'm sorry, at Trinity uh, College in Connecticut received so many death threats yesterday um, that the police actually shut down the college um, for fear uh, of his safety, for his safety and people on, on the campus. Uh, George Chicharriello Mayer, uh, who has tweeted, who's white, who has tweeted um, about racism um, and has been viciously attacked by neo-Nazis and alt-right and who is currently under investigation at his uh, college and university. Uh, Professor Dana Cloud, who's uh, at the University of Syracuse, um, who was involved in organizing an anti-racist uh, protest in response to an alt-right uh, demonstration in Syracuse, uh, has uh, just in the last 10 days has been the recipient of death threats um, and calls for her job. And so there's a climate that exists right now um, where there are small right-wing news outlets who um, are really working in collusion with Fox News uh, to target, harass, and uh, intimidate um, academics who uh, speak out uh, against racism, who talk about racism. Um, and I think that, you know, it's important to to, to stand up to that and um, to not cow to that, uh, even though um, you know it, it can be complicated. It raises uh, complications at one's workplace and with one's family. But you know this is part of a of a broader um, this is part of a broader trend that is happening in this country, and it needs to be talked about, and it needs to actually be incorporated more. I think into um, the organizing and the politics and the movement building that we're engaged in right now. And this... <laughs> this little snapshot that, that, that I gave of, you know, what, what we just saw just, just this week on this little uh, small book tour um, scratches the surface of what is going on. Um, and a lot of it's not new and predates Trump, um, and and some of it is, is is new or happening at another kind of level. So how do you how, how do you see th th what is happening now in terms of a difference uh, uh, from the, from pre-Trump? Well, I th I think that d we begin with the understanding that racism um, is systemic uh, in to the United States that in a country, you know, born of uh, the genocide of its native population that made its original wealth from the enslavement of, of Africans and that uh, tripled, you know, that wealth in untold ways through the brutal exploitation of waves of immigrant labor, that racism is, is, is part of the marrow um, of the United States. Uh, so we have to begin with that. But I do think that what we have now, I mean, for the previous 50 years or so, because of the civil rights movement and because of the black insurgency of the 1960s and 70s, um, that it, it put uh, uh, conditions upon the way that racism uh, was enacted on in our society. And so uh, it no longer was, was possible for elected officials to be openly racist. Um, it, it became 
uh, uh, socially unacceptable for open displays of racism uh, in ways that uh, didn't exist prior to the civil rights movement uh, or the black power struggles. And so what we're now seeing um, is uh, a, a kind of naked embrace um, from the, you know, starting with the President of the United States, uh, of virulent, naked uh, racism, uh, in some cases, uh, an extreme raci racist innuendo in other cases, uh, that really open up the, the, the gateway um, for many other uh, uh, people to kind of engage in this type um, of behavior. And so, if you have a, a president um, who, as you said in your open, opening remarks, uh, who openly refers to um, Latinos, Mexicans in particular, as rapists, um, and who, uh, you know, calls for a ban on Muslims. And, you know, do, I don't know if people even remember when he was running as a candidate. At one point, he's making up some ludicrous story uh, but about dipping bullets in, in pig's blood and shooting Muslims with those bullets. And so this is a kind of extreme uh, sort of open racism that we haven't really seen uh, in formal politics in this country in a very uh, uh, long time. And I, I do think that it's important to remember or to think about it within the context that it's happening because I don't think that racism uh, is ever fueled in the United States in such a way um, just for the sake of itself. That it's not just about a kind of naked hatred um, for black people or for other uh, uh, non-white people, but that it's always attached uh, to a broader agenda. And in this case, I don't think that there's, you know, that, that it's, it's simple coincidence that uh, Trump has this uh, kind of three-pronged strategy of um, anti-black racism, anti-immigrant hysteria, and Islamophobia that is combined with an, an, a, an, a, an economic agenda of complete austerity and hardship intended for poor and working class people in this country. And in fact, both of those go together, that the way that you get ordinary white people to accept their condition in this country is to get them to blame other groups of people for it. And so I think that that is important uh, uh, to, you know, I think that that's important to keep in mind. And that related to all of this in terms of uh, how these, these, the, these crises are managed, um, I think that's the context within w which we understand uh, the presence of racist and violent policing um, in communities of color, that when we have a political regime, and this certainly does predate Trump, where you have both parties locked in bipartisan agreement that we will no longer support a welfare state, that we will no longer support programs that are uh, intended to lift people out of poverty, to give people access to good jobs, that we will no longer support any programs like that, well then how do you manage the inevitable crises that develop um, because of that lack of basic attention? Um, and even beyond just the issue of, of, of social programs, the complete starvation of public infrastructure. So our public hospitals, public schools, the, the notion that there is a public responsibility in the first place, how do you manage that? It's through uh, 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 policing, it's through intense policing, so that in a city like Chicago, I don't know what it is here um, in Seattle, and someone you know, should find out uh, if people don't already know, but in, in the city of Chicago, 50% of the operating budget of the city goes to the police. So this is a city in Chicago where in 2012, 52 public schools were closed. 50% of the budget goes to the police. And so that, that is the, 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 the public policy of last resort mm -hmm. that, dem, you know, whether they're Democratic or Republican local administrations, city governments have come to rely on because they are no longer in the business um, of, of uh, funding and uh, funding the public infrastructure 
uh, or uh, backing and supporting programs that it, are it, intended to change these situations. And it, it's striking how often in, in, these, in these shooting cases, mental illness comes up, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and these are people who need help, right. they need care. And instead, they're facing gunshots, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And, and so this, I mean, is clearly connected to a public health crisis. Right. And, yeah. And you, you can see it in, and I'm, I'm from Chicago, which is why it's a reference point uh, for me, but uh, in the, the same budget that allowed for 52 public schools to be uh, closed, um, half of the public mental health uh, clinics were also closed. Um, and so these things, uh, these things often go together, where in jails across the country, they have become uh, the, the mental health facilities um, because the uh, uh, public hospitals um, that at least at one point were uh, supposed to attend to these uh, matters um, have had their budget cut, have had their budgets cut uh, and are no longer um, in a viable position to do that. And so really the only public institutions um, that don't have to endure, endure um, belt tightening and budget cuts are police, are jails, and are prisons. And so that is what is becoming the, uh, the, the public sector um, and social services that will uh, respond to uh, the crises of, of poverty, underemployment um, that exist in the cities across the country. And a another piece of this, right, is how race is used to justify the starving of the public sector, right? The whole narrative that it is black people, that it's immigrants who are gaming the system, exploiting the system, not paying their share, right? Uh, um, and I was really, I want to ask you to, to talk more about that because I, you know, I really feel that, 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 that this, like, deeply understanding how these reinforcing systems and rejecting this absurd dichotomy that it's either we focus on economics or, and class, or we focus on so-called identity politics, right? Um, that, that the task is to connect the dots and tell this coherent story, um, and a, co and a coherent history, a truthful history, right? Um, one of the things that struck me about the, the, this, uh, this, this killing, this horrific killing on the Max in, in Portland, right, is that in the reports, the eyewitness reports about what this guy, Jeremy Christian, who's uh, um, the attacker, the killer, had said to these young women, you know, he said, go back to where you come from, but he also said, get off the bus, you don't pay taxes, right? So he's echoing this line that he heard somewhere, right, about how people of color are freeloaders. He's literally saying that in, in the moments before the killing. Well, it's, it's, an, it's an old uh, trope, it's an old um, narrative that uh, I think it, it one point in the in the '60s, actually, Lyndon Johnson referred to uh, the the differences between tax eaters um, and tax makers, um, and so this division between um, you know who pays taxes and therefore uh, is deserving um, of of public services is is an old one, but it, you know it's also one that is built. Um, on lies, like the idea that there are, uh, or that undocumented immigrants don't pay taxes uh, in the in this in this country, um, but I do think that you know this is is it's it, it, it's an old narrative. I was talking earlier t uh, today. Um, I had seen uh, a news story where Donald Trump made some speech earlier uh, this week, uh, where he actually said that he wants to pursue legislation that prevents immigrants from collecting welfare for the first five years that they're in the United States. And it, it's, so, it's so problematic on, on so many levels. First of all, it, and it might be news to him, he is a billionaire, uh, of course, and not um, all that in touch with uh, the, 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 the daily news um, or, or history, but... Um, there, there really is no, no welfare uh, in this country for um, immigrants to, uh, for immigrants to collect. Uh, last year was the 20th anniversary 
um, of Bill Clinton's uh, efforts to change the, the, the welfare state as we know it and to end uh, welfare as, a, uh, as an entitlement to poor people um, in this country. Now, you know, it's possible for um, people to get access to food stamps uh, and that sort of thing, but the idea that uh, immigrants are coming to the United States for its generous welfare system um, is really just based on a racist lie uh, uh, that ignores the, the real contribution that um, immigrants, whether they're documented or not, uh, make to the uh, uh, economy. And it's the same uh, sort of racist mythology that uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, has tapped into where at one point in one of his uh, extemporaneous campaign speeches, he talked about moving people from welfare to work. Again, uh, a, a statement that has absolutely no correspondence with the political reality in the United States today, um, but is a wink and a nod to uh, his uh, white base um, that he's gonna get, uh, you know, black people off of welfare. Um, and again, uh, you know, a, an idea that has no basis um, in reality. And so to me, this is the most base, kind of cheap race baiting um, that is intended uh, to titillate his base without actually providing anything uh, substantive. Because when you look at the, the heart of, um, you know, his platform, his agenda, what is there um, in that that is really about transforming uh, the conditions that exist for working class people in general, whether they're white, whether they're uh, uh, African American, Latino, it is absolutely nothing. It's, it, it's not even smoke and mirrors. It is racism, bluff, and bluster uh, that is directed at people. So, I mean, what, one, of the, one of the scary parts of this, right, is that there's only so long he can maintain that bluster, right? Um, you know, he's counting on being able to put on a sort of a, sh these, these, these spectacle-like moments, like the carrier plant, um, you know, or like a sort of symb basically symbolic moves, like pushing through the Keystone XL pipeline or the Dakota Access pipeline. Um, but, but, and he, he thinks he can treat this like marketing because that's who he is, right? Um, and it's always worked for him in the past, right? I mean, this is what he's done with his investors over the years is just kind of snowed them. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that his you know, business empire has been on, always been on very, very shaky ground. So he's always gotten away with showmanship instead of substance. That's who he is. And he thinks he can do that when it comes to the American economy. This uh, is in the book, everyone. <laughs> just, just so you know, this is in the book. Um, but, but that that cannot last forever because people actually know whether they have a job or not. Like they know whether they have health care or not. You know, they know if they're losing social security. Um, and so, th what worries me is that if there isn't a left progressive alternative that is actually talking about redistribution that has a genuine jobs program. You know, I happen to think it has to be based on the need that our planet is in crisis and we need a rapid transition to 100% renewable energy, right? We all agree, we're in Seattle. Um, <laughs> we'll talk more about that later. Um, but in the absence of that vision, you know, and that ambition, that boldness, um, having a national platform and being represented on the ballot, right? then as that, the illusion of make America great again, bringing back the jobs again, falls away, then he has to double down on the race, because that's all he's got, right? All he's got is, is let's build the wall, um, you, you know, the, the travel ban, or worse, right? Um, and we haven't even talked about Jeff Sessions. So... That, that's the or worse. <laughs> And then Eric Prince lurking in the background, right. in the shadows, um, as always. So, so what do we do, right? Um, so there is this powerful legitimizing force from above um, that is incredibly dangerous, and, and I think we're, we're, we're all feeling that. Um, we've seen 
a people's response pushing back on a lot of different fronts. Have we seen enough of that popular response um, from progressive movements in the face of this surging white supremacy and xenophobia? No, but I do think it's important to say that um, that sentiment exists. And I, I think it's important to acknowledge that even if it is still um, disparate, disorganized, and just kind of in the air. And the reason why I say that is because there is a perception, I think, that ordinary Americans are much more conservative than, than they actually are. Um, and I think largely it's because the, our formal politics are so uh, conservative. So the Democratic and Republican parties, you know, obviously in different ways, um, but they don't create any political space for the, they don't create any political space that allows us to see the, the, the progressive aspect that exists among the population. And when I say that, I mean that for several years, a majority of Americans have supported um, a uh, government-run healthcare system, not just recently, but at least, you know, somewhere between 65 and 70 percent of Americans have supported in polls some kind of government health care system. Well, there's, there's no political home for you if you support that. There's no party that is entertaining that idea. And so it doesn't get taken up as a serious thing in, in the political establishment or the mainstream media. And there are all sorts of, of, of things like that. The majority of Americans, over 60% of Americans, think that there is a maldistribution of taxes, that the rich should be taxed more. Well, no political party is saying tax the rich, and so that idea doesn't resonate beyond the individual beliefs of those yeah. who talk about it in a poll. Yeah. Um, and, and so- this isn't just a, a, an American phenomenon. We just saw this in the UK, right. where Jeremy Corbyn was counted out. Right. Um, until he drops this manifesto right. that talks about serious redistribution, taxing the rich, if you want to talk full about funding of healthcare, getting rid of tuition fees, right. rapid transition to renewables, and suddenly he's surging. Right. People love it. 13 million people in this country voted for someone who calls themselves a socialist. That is <laughs> unprecedented. After a campaign of total vilification, you know, by his own party. And so I think it speaks to the deep wells of disgust, aside from the fact that, you know, there are 240 million eligible voters um, in this country, and about 120 million of them participated in the um, election. It's often interpreted as apathy, uh, which I think is a very uh, a shallow understanding of that. But the, the lack of participation in uh, electoral politics, to me, speaks more to the lack of an alternative. And so I think that that is an important starting point. Now, we've seen examples of, of the want, the desire um, for protest in social movements. We see it everywhere, whether it's the, the million, you know, the women's march, um, that produced the single largest day of protest in American history uh, after the inauguration. Something like three or four million people in this country alone, but people were protesting um, around the world. But we still see, after incidents of, of police brutality, um, people gather uh, 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 to protest, that there have been demonstrations that have tried to um, block and protest deportations yeah. um, from ICE. That there, there are all kinds of, of examples to, to point to. There is the, the massive, wasn't large enough, but still there are tens of thousands of people who marched against climate change um, in, in, in April in Washington, D.C. And so the challenge for progressive people, for the left, um, and indeed for radicals, is how do we unite these different movements um, in such a way that does not uh, uh, 
dilute the particular issues that are being fought for, um, but that shows the connection between the attacks on reproductive rights and the attacks on the environment, that makes the connection between uh, police brutality and mass incarceration um, and climate change uh, and, and the, 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 the militarization um, of, of, of the police and the military itself in this country. And so that is the, is the challenge and it would be more difficult if we thought we were doing it within a context where people didn't actually, uh, where there wasn't an audience, where people didn't actually want to be um, a part of uh, uh, a movement and a part of organizing. And so I think that that is the, the, the kind of daily challenge that activists are uh, engaged with, is how, what does solidarity mean and look like in this um, particular moment where the attacks are coming from so many different, uh, so many different places? And, and what does winning look like as well, right? right? Because this, you know, you mentioned those 13 million voters. Um, we are having, uh, seeing around the world these sort of the, the actual left, flawed as it may be, mm -hmm. getting closer to power than at any point in my right. adult life. Um, and this is scary because, I mean, if we can win, <laughs> mm -hmm. that means we have to win, which right. is very different than a few years ago where it was, where we, you know, it did not seem feasible, right. but realizing that the tide, since the 2008 financial crisis, the tide has shifted. You know, neoliberalism is dead. Trump ran against neoliberalism. He may be running right. a, a campaign that is furthering that agenda of privatization and deregulation and all of it, but that's not what he ran on. He ran promising to protect health care and, 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 uh, and, and social security and renegotiate trade deals in the interest of workers. Now, what he's actually doing is the opposite. He's renegotiating trade deals so that they're even more in the interest of corporations. His Commerce Secretary is going around reassuring the business community that they're going to use the TPP as the template for renegotiating NAFTA. That gets no news attention. Why? Because we have this never-ending reality sh show right. going on um, that our news media is entirely addicted to. So Trump's base isn't actually getting the news right. about what he's doing to their health care and their social security and um, and, and all the ways in which he's filling that swamp up. And, and, but th that's not as fun as covering this, this reality TV show of you know, who's going to get voted off the island next, right? right. Like right. find out after the next commercial, it could be the president himself. Right. You know? I mean, there is no better TV show than that. Right. You know? um, and I'm not saying that, it, that there's nothing to investigate. Of course there is, but, it, but, but should it be taking 95% of the news coverage? the covered? exclusion of everything yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. But, but I forget where I, where I was going with this. Well, let, me, let me ask you, <laughs> yeah. I, I want to yeah. ask you, given, given that and given what we've, the winning we've talked thing. about, How do what we do gives it? you hope? <laughs> well, I mean, this, this is, what gives me hope is that, is, is that we are getting closer. Um, and this is, this is a seismic shift. And I, what makes me afraid is, is that I'm worried that we're not organized enough <laughs> to seize the, this moment. And by organized, I don't just mean the institutions, I mean um, learning from our mistakes, right? Um, you know, I, I endorse Bernie. I, I love Bernie. Um, <laughs> but it's not 2016. I don't want to wallow there. Right. Um, I want to understand where, where, where we came short. Um, and, and I don't want to just blame the DNC and relive 2016 forever. It, I, we just seem to not be able to get out of that. Um, and, it, you know, we have, like, if... if, if, if if Hillary's not allowed to br blame the Russians for losing, we can't just blame the DNC, you know? Right. We have to ask some really tough questions about why Bernie wasn't able to reach more black and Latino voters. Mm -hmm. We have to ask tough questions about why he wasn't able to resonate with more older women, mm -hmm. right? 
And we can't just dismiss everybody as sellout neoliberals because there's lots of people who wanted to endorse him who were not excited about Clinton but didn't feel safe doing so. And you know, I think one of the best quotes in, in that book is, is our mutual friend Michelle Alexander, author of, of, of The New Jim Crow, who says that you know, if, if progressives don't get it together on race, they better have Elon Musk on speed dial because we're gonna need another planet. You know, and I, I think that pretty much cuts to the chase. So, um, I, you know, I'll come back to the hope question, but I want, but I, but, but I guess what, okay, so what gives me hope is that I see people reaching across silos mm -hmm. um, and, and, and trying to do this. Right. Um, and, and, and I'm afraid because I know that we don't have a lot of time um, whether before the next election or on the climate clock, um, which makes me a lot more afraid than the electoral clock. Um, and knowing that we can't be just fighting defense. Um, you know, if we win every defensive battle of the Trump era, we end up exactly where we were before Trump came in, and that was a disaster on every level, and it produced Trump. Right. So we have to do this complicated thing of, of of saying no and building the yes at the same time, right? Well, yeah. I also, I also think that it's important to know where you are in organizing a movement or building a movement, whether it's the beginning, the middle, or the end. And I think that we're at the beginning of, of this process, which doesn't mean that people weren't organizing um, and, and doing all sorts of things before um, the election of Trump, because obviously they were, uh, but that a Trump presidency introduces new complexities, new questions, and new problems. Um, and so we're at the beginning of this, this process of rebuilding uh, the networks, organizations, that will gain that experience and I think learn and make mistakes um, and have to learn from them uh, over the course of this administration. Um, and so I'm, I think that I'm optimistic about that prospect just because of the level of activity that people have already been engaged in, that you don't, you don't really have to have an argument about the need to, uh, to fight or, or to struggle. With a lot of people, you don't need to. The question is, what do we do? How do we do it? And that, that's why I think that, you know, at, at my, my Hampshire college thing, I talked about the need, you know, for a few things, but history most importantly, um, which is why, you know, it's which is why I wrote the book that I wrote, um, and which is why I think your book is important, because we have to arm politically a new generation uh, of people with the history and politics of the movements that have come before, the mistakes yeah. that were made, but also, you know, what that means for the, the, the movement that we're engaged in now. And those of us who have been active, you know, for a while also have to, you know, imbue some of the optimism of, of people who are, who are fighting right now who don't have the, the baggage of the defeats, whether it's the globalization movement, the anti-war movement, um, or the struggles that you know, people have been engaged in over the, last, over the last 20 years. And so I think that's where we are right now. Mm -hmm. And we have to figure out you know, what is the next step in the political struggles that we're engaged in now. But I think one of the important things that you, uh, that you talk about that is critical is also having the imagination to think about what could be, so that we're not just constrained by political pragmatism and, and what is possible only. You know, no real social movement starts out with what is realistic. Mm -hmm. You start out with what you want. Mm -hmm. What is it that we want? Mm -hmm. And that... <laughs> and a lot of us, we want to be free. You know, we want real freedom. And that's a... There's a lot of steps in between getting from where we are today to that. 
But if we don't think about that, and we only think about the midterm elections in 2018 or, you know, some dreadful thought like that, then, you know, it really is hard to keep going. And so I think there's, we're at the beginning, and it's important to take stock of that. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that um, where I get excited is just the way I see people stepping up in all the places that these maniacs do not control, right? Like Trump and his cabinet of millionaires and billionaires control a very powerful arm of the US government, but they do not control everything, right? And as we see how dangerous what they're doing is, um, then I, what I feel talking to people and, and, and just seeing what, the way people have responded is just a real maturity and commitment to do everything we can in the spaces that they do not control. They do not control what cities do, like Seattle. They do not control what states do, especially states without Republican governors, right? Um, they do not control what sovereign tribes do. They do not control what sovereign governments do. They do not control what universities do with their endowments, right? And so in all these areas where we maybe were letting stuff slide, now it's like, well, we have to step up. Like we have to, whatever power we do have, whether it is getting the city of Seattle to divest from DAPL, which was an amazing victory, right? That was so great. Um, you know, or stepping up and saying, you know, you can get, hand out all the coal leases you like, and you can and 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 you can hand out all the all all of the the executive orders that you want about pipelines. But this place here is not going to allow any new fossil fuel infrastructure, right? We just won't let them build it. We're counting on Seattle to do that, and we have that commitment. Um, we have that commitment from from other coast, coastal cities. Um, and it's really going to get in their way. And you know, you mentioned uh, the fact that most Americans want single payer health care. It's really significant that the California Senate just got one step closer to, to, to single, single payer. One of my favorite moments of, uh, of, of this, um, of, of these. Of these, I won't, won't say the Trump presidency because it wasn't him, but, but on that horrible day when Trump announced in the Rose Garden that he was withdrawing from the Paris Accord because he was going to negotiate a better, better deal. deal? Yeah. yeah. Um, that was the part that killed me. I knew he was going to withdraw from the Paris <laughs> Accord um, because he had been, as he explained, elected by the people of Pittsburgh, not the people of Paris. Um, I mean, sorry, the, yeah, and, and then the mayor of Pittsburgh steps up and says, well, actually, uh, Pittsburgh voted Democrat and, um, and then pledged to get Pittsburgh to 100% renewable energy by 2035, which is the most ambitious target in the country, you know? Um, and, you know, we have lots of friends and uh, local organizers who are pushing to make sure that that is a real justice-based transition, um, that it includes labor, doesn't leave workers behind, um, that, it, that it centers frontline communities who have borne the toxic burden of, the, uh, uh, of our addiction to fossil fuels. Um, but that spirit, right, that spirit of, of pushing back like that, and I think we are going to see some really exciting things happen at the, at the city level and at the state level in response to this horror show in Washington. We're already seeing that. And when people live the alternatives, um, they, 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 they start to really believe it's possible, right? And on climate, the good news is we don't, you know, we don't get our energy from the federal government. You know, those decisions are not made there. They can make it easier for us to do the right thing. They can put good incentives in place. They can pass a carbon tax that is progressive and bold. They're not going to do that, but they cannot stop us from doing what's right. And we're at a good point now where, where, where you know, tech, solar technology and wind technology, the prices have dropped so much that it is absolutely competitive with fossil fuels. So we, you know, we can't use them as an excuse to stand in the way of this transition. In fact, the opposite, right? We need to do so much more because of the damage they're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. The last, the, the, the last thing that I want to say, and then I have a last question for you, is um, I think the one thing I point I, I really wanted to get across was the need for 
um, mass movements. And I think, you know, I've, I've sort of alluded to protest and that sort of thing, but I think that the power of, of mass demonstrations and, and protests is important to say because sometimes people think, well, we've done that and here we are and uh, does protest, do protest still matter? Um, and I think in two regards that they're incredibly important. I think right now, uh, especially with the, the growth and organization of uh, white supremacist organizations, um, that they actually think that um, because they have a president in the White House and because um, the, the president's chief strategist, Steve Bannon, uh, has openly been sympathetic uh, to uh, white supremacists, that it's their time. And I think that the way that we uh, marginalize that notion and that idea uh, is through uh, large protests and demonstrations that actually show um, that they are a minority uh, and that they should be marginalized. Um, and I also... So, so just specifically, I mean, this is a city that has been yes. the site of a very recent horrific police shooting. So I mean, what should the response be? Well, I think, I mean, that, I mean, the, the response to, to police brutality, the, the key part is understanding its connection um, to these other issues because often the, the, the most sort of visible victims of police brutality are African Americans, Latinos, and uh, in this part of the country, uh, uh, indigenous and native people um, as well. But police brutality may be our particular um, burden, but it's everyone's problem who is an ordinary working person. Because when we come to believe or see that it's just one particular group's uh, uh, problem, we miss the effects of, uh, uh, of uh, policing overall. And the, the best example I like to use about that is, you know, we look at how racial profiling uh, has been used to target African Americans. And then after 9-11, racial profiling was used to uh, target uh, Arabs and Muslims. Um, and so much so that it allowed for the growth of the, the security state, um, the, you know, the sort of post 9-11 uh, uh, state. And you could see, though, how quickly its focus could pivot from African Americans, uh, from Latinos, and from Muslims uh, to white people when you look at how uh, the uh, federal government colluded with local governments to shut down the Occupy movement um, in the winter of 2012. Um, and so when the, the allowing for the police state to grow when it's directed at some people uh, eventually comes back uh, to affect all of us, aside from the fact that this government spends $80 billion a year um, to maintain its criminal justice system, and so that we all have an interest in organizing against it. And so I think that the mass aspect of the protest is important, not only in terms of who it is against, but also in terms of what it does for our side, uh, and giving people the confidence to know that uh, we are not isolated. You know, if you are rejecting those kinds of politics, you are not by yourself, but that there are hundreds of other people, thousands of other people uh, who believe that as well. And so it's a very powerful experience to be a part of that. And I think that we often underplay or can underplay the, the role that protests uh, uh, plays in building our movements itself. And so I think that is, is, is also a part of building an opposition uh, and a, a sort of bottom-up uh, resistance that, that we've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And so, last, last question is about the, the book specifically. And what do you, what do you think is the most um, important lesson that you came upon uh, with the book that you think is, is most critical for people here or people who want to figure out what do I do when I leave here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I 
think it's, it, it, it's what I was sort of talking about earlier about, about the, the heavy, the fearsome responsibility of realizing that we are the majority. <laughs> um, and, and that we, you know, so that we can't just um, blame others or blame the conservatism of the culture or whatever. Um, that, is, that is such a fearsome responsibility. And so I give, you know, I end the book with a chapter about the emergence of people's platforms, right? Because I think we are in this moment where it isn't clear what the electoral strategy is. You, you and I were both at the People's Summit in Chicago, and I don't, I, you know, it was, it was a beautiful gathering, and the National Nurses United, who, you know, are a visionary union in this country, offered up their infrastructure um, to all of these social movements, and it was, um, it, I think it did represent an evolution um, in the way that it centered frontline and young voices and, you know, the current leaders uh, of social movements. Um, and, and it was exciting. But in terms of a strategy, right, in terms of an electoral strategy, it really was not clear. You know, I mean, I think a lot of people went into the People's Summit thinking that they were going to know, okay, well, is, this, is, the, is the goal inside the Democratic Party or is it outside or is it one foot in and one foot out? Uh, is Bernie running? Is he not running? Like, is it Elizabeth Warren? Like, what is the thing? And, and I, can, I know that I left more confused. I don't know about you. Did, what, did, did you leave knowing? Did, did I miss the session? <laughs> yeah, so we don't know, right? And... Um, it's going to become clear when it becomes clear, but we can't be passive in the face of this, right? Um, and so uh, I'm excited about the emergence of, of, of these people's platforms of, of, from a bottom-up process, people coming together. The, the Vision for Black Lives is a, is a great example of this, this platform that came out of the Movement for Black Lives, a really utopian, sweeping document for how to not just ch respond to police violence, though that too, but how to restructure the U.S. economy um, in deep repair. Uh, and and I, I tell the story of a, of a project that I've been involved in in Canada called the LEAP Manifesto, and if people are interested in it, they can go to theleap.org. I also have the, the manifesto itself printed at the back of the book, um, not because it's like perfect and figured everything out, but just as an example of what happens when 60 movement organizers and theorists lock themselves in a room together for two days and try to figure out what we want, not just what we don't want, and which is not something we're very good at doing, you know? And it, it, was, it was a really, um, it was a process that made us realize that the ultimate triumph of neoliberalism really was this war on the imagination because it was scary to actually have to try to answer that question, like what does the future we want look like? And to come together across deep, deep divides, you know, and, and this community knows all about this, you know, to have um, leaders from unions representing resource workers across the table from the executive director of Greenpeace and indigenous leadership and uh, who, you know, have been in conflict um, for, 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 uh, over, you know, specific projects for a long time to try to get to a, a, some common ground, you know. And it covers everything from trade policy to guaranteed annual income. Um, uh, but more important, I think, than the specific policies is this, uh, is, is sort of recognizing that we are so far gone that really what this is about is a deep shift in values, that this, that the values that Trump is just a symptom of, right, of endless, um, uh, 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 extracting from the earth and from labor, from people, from communities, as if there's no limit, and then just disposing of people and 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 forests and you know what's called overburden in the mining industry. I mean, this is the culture that that, that capitalism is, and and trying to shift from that culture of endless taking to a culture of deep caretaking and a culture, moving from a culture of brute force to a culture of consent, right? Consent um, at every level, which is really a radical concept, which is why the document starts with the full implementation of the United Nations declarations for the rights of, on the rights of indigenous people because what is radical about that document is it says that there can be no activity on indigenous land without free, prior, and informed consent, right? Um, so 
so I'm ex I, I'm excited by these attempts, right? And 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 that I, I think the thing that that I'm most excited about is that you know, my generation of activists was was afraid of proposing what we wanted in a lot of cases, and also afraid of engaging with political institutions in a lot of cases. There was a certain purism to it and a certain fetish of decentralization and disorganization <laughs> a little bit. And I, you know, what I see in this up and coming generation is a lot more confidence um, and a, and, and just a willingness to do all of it at once, right? Like, of course, we have to build the social movements on the outside, and of course, we have to engage with electoral politics, too, and everything in between. Um, and I find that really exciting. I see uh, that, that, that there is a maturing. Like, there is, there is, we are getting ready to, to you know, I use the phrase evolutionary leap because I like leaping. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think there are really good signs. And, and, and the thing that, that we always have to remember is that we don't have we don't have we don't have time, right? right? But I, you know, I I'm a writer and you're a writer, and I think we know that deadlines can be helpful, right? Yes. Um, I mean, do we ever do anything without it? I wrote this book in three months, people. Okay, um, deadlines can kick your butt. Um, so yeah, so so should, should we should we invite Anthony back up on stage? Yes. So he can leave around. Get the book. <laughs> Thank it's you, very Kianga good. Yamana Taylor. Thank you. <laughs>
Because as our good friend Gopal Dayanani um, from Movement Generations, who was just in discussion with Naomi and Berkeley, said, we have reached a point of peak incrementalism, and we need to move from this failed neoliberal model fueled by hypercapitalism, abject avarice, and embrace a trajectory that leads us to a place where we are caring for the world while caring for each other. So when we're talking about this idea of intersectionality, we have to move from intersectionality being just a concept and a noun and moving to intersectionality also being a verb, a process actually exercised. And the truth is, we do have to look at ourselves in that fashion. There are things within our movement. This is also a time for massive introspection so that we get from that no to the yes, so that we get from going 0 for 4 in congressional races because we're not producing the candidates who are really ready to move beyond peak incrementalism and to a radical agenda. I think we're ready for that. And as I invite my friend um, Aji on stage, I'm going to um, embarrass Naomi really quickly and read from her book really, really quickly, I promise Naomi, because if we're going to be intersectional, we also have to be intergenerational. This is also an intergenerational fight. Naomi wrote in her book about children, that these children have done nothing to create the crisis, but they are the ones who will deal with the most extreme weather, the storms and droughts and fires and rising seas, and all the social and economic stresses that will uh, flow as a result. They are the ones growing up amidst a mass extinction, robbed of so much beauty and so much of the companionship that comes from being surrounded by other life forms, and that has to come to an end. And to that end, I am so pleased to invite my good friend Aji up here for Plant for the Planet. He is one of the, uh, uh, the, the young folks who have successfully, um, in the process of suing the US government for not addressing climate change seriously. Please give him a hand. Aji, are you here? I said hello everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm Aji Piper. I'm 16 years old. Um, I'm a junior uh, in high school. Actually about to finish. Uh, tomorrow's my last day of finals. Yeah. I'm so close. Um, and it's not often a 16 year old actually gets a chance to speak at an event where Naomi Klein is in front of I don't know, how many people do you think are in here? At least a couple hundred, I'd say. You know, it's just a little bit, just a little bit of people. Um, and I'm actually really, really honored to be here. It's a, it's a really, really great honor. Um, I'm here kind of representing uh, several various organizations that I'm with, that I'm part of. I've been uh, a climate activist for about four years now. Uh, well, no, sorry, five, since I was like, well, 13, 12, 12, 13. It, it gets hard sometimes. <laughs> it sounds so strange. I should be able to remember all the years, but I can't. Um, I'm actually here with Plant for the Planet, a youth-led organization that plants trees all around the world. I'm here with Earth Guardians Rise, a national youth council uh, that uh, is, is dedicated to creating youth leaders around our country. Um, and trying to bring a grassroots movement from everywhere. And I'm also here with Our Children's Trust, which is the nonprofit organization that has not only lawsuits against state governments in almost all 50 states, but is bringing a lawsuit against the federal government and the current administration. <laughs> now, I think it's also really important to recognize that uh, there is definitely a lot in um, our daily lives that is now affected by our president and his administration. And it's really important to recognize that we cannot lose sight of the goals that we have had for so long. We cannot let the shock of our new president stop us from moving forward with the fights that we have fought for so long. So, um, shoot, I'm freezing up. Let me just say, I'm, I'm kind of hot in here. I'm like, 
Thank you. Thank you. Give me a moment. Just, just a couple seconds. You have all you need. I have all I need. You're right. I have all I need right here. <laughs> I have all I re need right here because I'm looking out at. I well, I actually can't see your faces unless you're right in the front row. <laughs> so uh, I believe I'm looking out at a sea of faces, right, at a crowd of people who are all here because they recognize the danger that we're facing. Because they recognize that. Uh, the future generation's lives are at stake in the work that we are doing here. That my life is at stake in the work that we are doing here. And I, I am, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm really, really honored to be here. We started this lawsuit a while ago, like 18 months, I believe. And we went through several different processes, the motion to dismiss, and we won that. The judge said, no, this case should go to trial. And the interveners, which are 650 about fossil fuel corporations uh, in their three big uh, trade associations, and the United States government were like, well, let's appeal that because we definitely don't want this to go to court. The next judge said, nope, it's going to court. These kids have fundamental rights to clean water, to clean air, and land that they can live on that's not poison. And after those two decisions, next comes discovery, right? So now we're getting to discover all kinds of cool things about what the US government has been hiding for 50 years. And then comes trial, which is, I don't know, hopefully it's like around next year um, or, or the end of this year. Um, but that's gonna be really, really cool. Now there, this is probably where I'd be like wrapping up uh, the little bit that I was saying uh, but I forgot the little bit that I was saying, so I'll wrap up anyway. Um, it's an honor, once again, to be here speaking in front of you. Uh, but it's also kind of a shame that I have to get up to speak for my future, that my rights are being violated on such a large level. Don't get me wrong, I'm definitely happy to be here. This is an awesome experience. Like, how many 16-year-olds, you know, can be like, yeah, I spoke in an event where Naomi Klein was totally having a book signing and it was just freaking awesome, right? <laughs> Not many. So my ask for you actually tonight is a couple things. Uh, if you're here in Seattle, um, first, check out the tables out there. They're really awesome. Uh, a lot of them are organizations that I've worked with and I know about. Uh, Got Green, Plant for the Planet, of course. Yeah, give it up for Got Green. And, um, and 350. And I would just say, you really look at those projects that they have there. Um, and then I, you know, I also have some things that I'd, I'd like to kind of throw out there. Imagine the idea of gas pump warming labels. Like, you know, like a nozzle uh, or on the nozzle of your gas pump, it says like a little like, you know, the purchasing of this product leads to the devastation of your forests and killing of your children's lungs. Yeah, just like, just like those cigarette warning labels, except those ones are tiny and on the banner in the back of the store. These ones would be like right in your hand every time you look at it. And the idea is that it helps kind of like reduce that diffuse responsibility. So everybody looks at it and is like, I'm contributing to this. Um, and if you want to know more about that, definitely look at the Plant for the Planet table because um, they have you know, some more stuff about that. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Naomi will be signing books shortly. Thank you. And Kianga is signing books.